It's been called the scourge of the state, human trafficking, child sex trafficking, a subject that's basically been living in the shadows. So to expose and put some light on this subject, our focus for this episode is human and child sex trafficking. I'm Wes Allen. Thanks for tuning in. Joining me today at the Focus Roundtable are Sarah Reesing, Outreach Coordinator for Georgia Cares, the single statewide coordinating agency to connect services, treatment care for child sex trafficking victims. Christy Clark, Investigator with the Douglas County Sheriff's Department. And Brenda Hillman, Executive Director of Youth Emporium, a nonprofit organization which is the founder of the Voices for Safe Haven Human Trafficking Initiative. Its mission is to educate and empower young people and their parents on crime and teach strategies they can employ to protect themselves in order to avoid abduction. Ladies, thank you for joining me. Thank Appreciate you. it very much. I think the first time that I heard about a large scale modern day human trafficking was back in 2014 when a dozen young women were freed from basically sex slavery and in Savannah and 23 people got arrested and convicted. I honestly thought this was more of a, a one-time occurrence, an anomaly more than um, something that, that happens every day. And I have been surprised to find out that I have been wrong. How big is this problem? So we know that within the United States, we have been between 100,000 and 300,000 youth at risk each year. And we also know that this time in history, we have more slaves than ever before. You know, a lot of people think about the slave trade back during the Civil War time and even earlier. And we have more today than but then. Than ever before. Well, let's define what we're talking mm -hmm. about. I, I took this off of um, the, the national website. I did not know that there was an actual undersecretary uh, in, in the cabinet mm -hmm. for, for this problem. It says now, sex trafficking in which a commercial sex act is induced by force, fraud, or coercion, in which the person induced to perform such an act has not attained 18 years of age or the recruitment, harboring, transportation provision, or obtaining of a person for labor of services through the use of force, fraud, coercion for the purpose of subjection to involuntary servitude. So, I mean, that, those are a bunch of big words, but basically we're talking about exploitation. Right, and under the federal law, anyone under the age of 18 that's induced into the commercial sex trade, um, it doesn't, they're a victim regardless of if there's force, fraud, or coercion. They're automatically a victim. Okay, you said this sounds like something from the Civil War or before. You know, we were all taught in history. Mm -hmm. You know, the, um, it was tobacco to rum to slaves thing. You remember the big triangle that would, this is colonial America. Right. You know, back in the 1700s when this is done. As I started the research for this show, I thought this was gone, and obviously it isn't. I thought this only happened in like third world countries mm -hmm. like Nigeria that are on the air. You, you hear about that. It's obviously a problem. But what's unfortunate is that many of our citizens actually think that way, and that's what places our children in more danger because they close their mind to the fact that American teenagers, American children are also at risk. Um, just as we may have children that come here from a foreign country who are uh, brought in for the purpose of domestic servitude or sexual exploitation or forced labor, the same thing can occur to an American child who may be sent to a foreign country to perform those same services. So it's not just an, an issue of happening in a foreign land. Yeah, and one of the things that I think point. is really important for our citizens to understand is that America still is one of the primary destinations for traffickers. There's money here, there's a great demand here, and as a result, traffickers want to bring product here. Um, and we're looking at it from a standpoint, well, how could this be? You know, we're, we're sleeping on the issue because we think it's happening in another country and it's happening right here at home. 
on our own soil. How does this happen? I, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, this is, we live here in Douglas County. Mm -hmm. It is because of our Sheriff's Department in particular, a very safe place to live. Mm -hmm. We've got great law enforcement. We have wonderful cooperation between our citizens and law enforcement. How does this happen? I mean, you're, you we're looking in a um, family-oriented, safe community with good schools and good water and good transportation, all the, mm -hmm. the Chamber of Commerce accolades. How does this happen? Well, victims of human trafficking come from all walks of life. It doesn't matter if you have a good family or you have good parents. Um, they are your victims are, big, are um, being told false things by their trafficker. There um, could be a female, it could be a male. It, it, they grow up in a, could grow up in an abusive home. They could grow up um, with little or no education. They could grow up in a great home, but when you get a trafficker that promises them nails and hair being done, finest of clothes, clothing, um, giving them money and lots of money and then they they are being recruited right out of their neighborhoods that's that's what happens mm -hmm. how, okay how do these traffickers and basically we're talking about pimps mm -hmm. how do these traffickers get these kids, I mean, you're saying right out of the neighborhoods? Are they, 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 they actually can. And driving really, in the white van down the street? Well, no, they, no. They, they talk to them. It's like a recruiting. It's like they could be, you can have a gang. You know, everybody knows we have gangs everywhere in Georgia. Um, it could be a gang that recruits them. And then they, they're called bottom girls is what they're called. Um, you can have a girl that is part of a gang that recruits for her, as you, you called pimp, we call the traffickers. Traffickers. Um, and they befriend these people. And it doesn't have to be a girl. Mainly they are girls, but we've had boys. Mm -hmm. um, I told you earlier when we talked that we've had two known cases in Douglas County. One of human traffic labor mm -hmm. of a 13 year old. And then we've had one sex trafficking and it was boys. Okay, so when we're talking about labor trafficking, this is almost like the, the old, what, what we learned in school as indentured servant, mm -hmm. that you're here, you're working, you have to... You're paying you, to live with them. You're paying mm -hmm. to live with them. Mm -hmm. and, and they have a hold over you. Correct. Or mm -hmm. they paid for something and you'll never be able to repay them back. And, and in return, you're doing all of this work and all of this labor. Mm -hmm. And then the sex trafficking is actually sex trade. For something of value. For something right. of value on that. Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily money. It could be shelter, food, Correct. anything of value. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if you think of human trafficking as an umbrella, it breaks down into the labor trafficking and the sex trafficking. How often does this happen? Every day. It happens every day to a, to a child in our country. Um, and one of the things that I tried to get people to understand is that this is a very sophisticated um, criminal enterprise. We are living in a modern day slavery environment. They are internet savvy, tech savvy. Um, they utilize the internet as a major recruitment mm -hmm. tool. Um, our young people go online, they have the Kick account, Correct. Instagram accounts, they have uh, Facebook accounts, Twitter accounts, um, Grinder is another one. All of these apps have GPS trackers on them. Our young people get online and, you know, say they're at the mall and they're taking a, a selfie with their girlfriends, very innocent to them, but to someone who finds them attractive and looks at them as a potential source of income, that person is looking at that child and saying, okay, I know where she is. I like her. I have customers who like her, would like her. So they know where they are. They're at the mall, they're at the food court, they're at you know H&M buying a, a, a shirt. And this person who is online just tracking activity now knows where these children are. And because they've 
provided personal information online, their name, um, got engaged in a conversation of some kind. They have educated this person, and this person now uses that as a means of luring them into their web. Well, they start talking to them on those accounts, and mm -hmm. then you have kids, 10 and 11, that are, are friending people on Kick, and they're talking to them, and they don't even know who they are it's because, on the other side. and parents aren't checking phones. I, mm -mm. Well, I was talking at a forum with her one time, and I told parents, you pay that bill, you look at that phone. If they don't know that, they don't, they don't need to talk to people they don't know because these people are encouraging these children to send them pictures of their body. Mm -hmm. And when you get a nine and 10 year old, that's what they're, they're wanting. They are wanting the innocence of that child to mm -hmm. see and then they're preying on that child. They're um, asking for these pictures, they're telling them how beautiful they are, they're telling them all this putting stuff in their head and they're sending that stuff. And then, and Brenda's right, they can um, get them to tell them where they live. Mm -hmm. And they tell them, kids tell them. And that's sometimes they don't even have, have to, tell to tell them, them. because they're the GPS tracking that's on their accounts, they could actually find these children. And that's what people don't understand. When you go online, I don't know if you ever purchased something online, it'll say deny or allow your location. You know, when yes. you allow your location, you, yes. you, you open yourself up to people who are online for the purpose of just finding where, where's my next revenue stream. And they utilize our children that way. And one thing that I try to get people to understand is that Snapchat, Kick, those accounts, oftentimes once a trafficker is connected with a child, their trail is erased within like three to five seconds. Correct. So you can't find the trafficker, but the trafficker now knows where you are. So it, it's a very frightening scenario to look at, but th that's what we're dealing with. And um, it's happening all over. Every state in our country has reported it, cases of trafficking. And in Georgia specifically, um, since Georgia CARES inception in 2009, we've received over 1,600 referrals, and that's here in the state of Georgia. We've received referrals from over 100 counties in our state, so it's not just a metro Atlanta area. Mm -hmm. And last year alone, Georgia CARES, we served over 460 youth, and those are youth here in Georgia. Mm -hmm. This is scary. Mm -hmm. I had never thought about the, the GPS tracking. Mm -hmm. I recently was headed to Alabama uh, for a meeting, and I didn't know exactly where I was going, mm -hmm. and my smartphone, you know, I punched in the address, and all of a sudden there it was where I was, and then there was a little arrow on where the meeting was, and it was tracking how to get there and which turns to make. This is what they're using. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. See, I'm thinking of it in a completely different way that this GPS is a wonderful thing for me. Mm -hmm. This is just downright scary yes. on that they can be in the food court in the mall. And, and I'm seeing, you know, I see it all the time. Mm -hmm. When I go to the food court in the mall, mm -hmm. everybody is on their cell phone. They are. Everybody is on their smartphone. I mean, you, it's, it's like eat a taco and punch in something. Eat another bite of taco, punch in something. So they're being tracked, and these kids do not have the education to know that this is dangerous? But, but they're, they're innocent, and that's what we have to look at. We have to look at the innocence of the victim. They're not thinking about an evil person. You know, children- No, we're taught children, to be- uh, uh, Kind, good, considerate, yes. mannerable, uh, respectful of authority. You know, we teach our children to be, you know, respectful of their elders and, you, you know, kind to the next person. We want our children to grow up to be purposeful, caring adults. But at the same time, we need to also educate and empower our children so they can avoid situations where a trafficker might find them and utilize, you know, some type of strategy to lure their child out of, out of their care. And that's the thing that, that frightens me as a, as a service provider and someone who's interested in educating our children about the enterprise. We have to take a different approach now because these people are just downright evil. They have no respect for human life. They care nothing about, you know, the emotional attachment you might have to your child. 
um, they're not looking at your child that way. It's not a brown thing, a yellow thing, a white thing, a red thing. It's a green thing with them. The more money they can make off of your child, the longer they're going to keep doing what they're doing. And the younger they are, um, the more attractive they are to them. You know, we've had talks uh, before about um, even babies being brought into this web. Um, babies are raised up in sexualized environments because the longer they can um, entrap a child, the longer they'll be able to make money. A child can generate between $100,000 and $150,000 a year for a trafficker. That's a lot of money. They're not going to easily give that up. Well, like you were saying, every child is at risk. You know, like you were saying, it's not a black issue, a white issue. It doesn't care what your religion is or where you live or maybe your financial status. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all children are at risk. Any child that's ever felt insecure or misunderstood or maybe they're fighting with their parents and want mm -hmm. some more independence mm -hmm. or testing some boundaries. Right. Um, and I think I just described every child in America right there. Yeah. And the thing of it is, is that those vulnerabilities is what allows a trafficker to inch their way into their life. Um, they get online and they say, oh, you know, I'm mad at my mom. She did this, she did that. She hates me, I hate her. You know, just banter that, you know, we may find, you know, a little unsettling, but we don't get bent right. out of shape about it because that's what teens do, that's what tweens do. They talk about their parents. Yeah. But a trafficker will look at that and say, I know how you feel. I feel the same way. You know, the same thing happened to me. And this person could be 49 years old talking to they, this baby. They make them think that they're their age. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And because you don't know their age. So they're telling them, they're making them think that's their age. Exactly. That they're on the same level. And they they tell them that, um, you know, that I know where, what you're going through. I'm going through the same thing. Exactly. Talk to me about it. And I stress to parents, when I talk to parents about their children, I stress to them, be more involved. Look in your kid's phone. You have every right to look in their phone. Um, now we're giving kids phones in elementary school. They don't need phones in elementary school. They don't even need a phone in middle school. Mm -hmm. um, I encourage going through their rooms, going through their book bags, going through their cars. You need to know what your kids are doing because mm -hmm. that's your job as a parent. If you don't know what your kid's doing, you're failing as a parent. Mm -hmm. My and parents always told me, you're in my house, you have no privacy. <laughs> yes. I, I tell my kids that too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you live under my roof. I'm paying for the food on, your, on the table and things like this. Therefore, you're going to live by my Correct. rules. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but sometimes yeah. even the house isn't safe. There's intrafamilial that's pimping correct. that's going on where the parents are the ones that are trafficking their oh, own child. Or yeah. Maybe yes. they're selling their child to a trafficker. Yes. So, you know, it could even be the parents that are doing this. This, this is a huge problem, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, and we refer all of our kids to Georgia Cares with yeah. Sarah and them. Yeah, so anything that y'all Anything see. that we think mm -hmm. could be. And sometimes, you know, we'll refer them, and Sarah will tell you, we don't have that issue. We just have signs of sex trafficking that could be a sign to us, and then we refer them to Georgia Cares. Mm -hmm. um, and then they do their process and decide whether or not they need to do anything else. And that's her mm -hmm. expertise. Okay, so mm -hmm. when, if, okay let's, let's back up just a little bit on we've got all these kids mm -hmm. out there in the middle of the mall or, you know, we're having dinner at a restaurant or something like this. Uh, this is obviously happening as a whole world into itself, and there's no way that we can jump in on social media, you know, and block the Snapchat from between these two people and all. So, we as everyday citizens, what should we be looking for uh, in in the general public as we are just out and out and about in our everyday lives? Well, there, there are signs um, to identify somebody who might be trafficked. You know, you can look at your child and she's, they're not eating, um, they are um, depressed all the time, there's been a change in their outward appearance, either they stopped caring about how they look or now they're wearing clothes that are very expensive that you know you didn't buy. There's things that you can look for in your own child to determine whether or not something shady might be going on. And I tell people all the time, you know, if you've got that feeling that something is not right, then something probably is not right. 
and there are ways to sit down and talk to your daughter or your son because um, it's not a gender specific crime. You know, they look for students and children in the LGBT community just like they do heterosexual community. So it's it's not something that's just targeted to uh, a one specific gender or, or race as, as we had talked about earlier. So I, I try to encourage people, you know, just, just track the behavior of your child, see if there's any major differences going on. Um, also vet their friends, you know, just because somebody comes in and says, oh, hello, Miss Smith, you know, how are you feeling today, whatever, you don't know if that child is also part of a gang. Um, as, as Christy mentioned, it could be that this child is targeting your child for someone who is paying them to go out and recruit. So as a parent, you have to know where your, your child is going. To say, I want to go over to Susie's and spend the night. If you don't know Susie's parents, if you've never been by Susie's house, um, I would encourage you not to let your daughter go to Susie's because you don't really know what's going on inside of that home. Um, and talking about those parents who are actually trafficking their children out of desperation, economic desperation, many people are actually selling their children. It's unfortunate, but it's happening. Um, children who are caught up in trafficking that end up with an unwanted pregnancy, oftentimes their children wind up being sold into trafficking or their child is taken away from them, um, and then that baby then becomes the property of the trafficker. It is actually mirroring what happened during slavery. When uh, a slave you know, gave birth, it then becomes the property of the plantation owner. It's the same principle, except it's now in a modern day environment. So it's unfortunate, but it is occurring. And like you were saying, the warning signs, you know, if the youth has a significantly older boyfriend or girlfriend or mm -hmm. if they have multiple STDs, I mean that's a dead giveaway too or if there's a special marked branding or tattoo on them. Oftentimes traffickers will brand their youth mm -hmm. either with the trafficker's name or if the trafficker's affiliated with a gang, perhaps the gang symbol. Um, and like you touched on too, if there's some material possessions like a new phone or jewelry or things like that that the youth can't account for, it's worth raising a red flag and looking into it. Mm -hmm. Okay, since I don't have children, if I'm out in the middle of the mall, what am I looking for? There's, it's hard to tell you what to look for, Wes. There, in the everyday mall, you never know. I mean, I, I would tell you that I wouldn't even know what to look for just standing in the mall. Because mm -hmm. you don't know who's dropped that kid off or who that kid might be with. I mean, that would be a hard, that's a hard thing to say. To identify. To identify yeah. like very, that. Very and, and the mall is now the community babysitter. I mean, mm -hmm. it could, they could be at a bus stop. Mm -hmm. They could be they at a hotel. They could be in school. They could be in their, in their neighborhood. And it's hard to, to, to say the signs there. Okay. But. There's a full list of warning signs on our website, gacares.org, if parents ever want to go print them out or community members and become familiar with them, they're on our website. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's just say that I'm a parent or I have, there's something I suspect um, or, you know, a parent suspects. Mm -hmm. What should they do? You can make a referral to Georgia Cares. Um, again, if you go on our website, gacares.org, we have a referral form you can fill out and submit to us. And then we'll do an intake process and go from there. Yeah, but what if, I mean, how are you going to find if, if do, do we need to call 911 if we I mean, They can make a report, this? yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I then, encourage people to have a relationship with their law enforcement community. It is so vital, and I know we've got you know a lot of issues as it relates to the law enforcement and com community policing and, and that kind of thing. But I look at the law enforcement community as the first responders in this type of situation. They're more familiar with forensic interviewing. They know, they know how to ask the right questions and not be intimidating because sometimes kids will just fold up and not tell their parents. Right, right. You know, but they may talk to someone else. Um, and I also encourage young people, especially those who are in leadership roles in schools, you know, to develop a different attitude about kids that you may see who are not as um, fortunate. fortunate as them or who 
may look like they need a friend, you know, how to befriend them and encourage them to go speak with the school counselor or the school resource officer. I think we are very fortunate to have the kind of community that we do where law enforcement does care. Um, we've, we've had community forums where our district attorney has come and spoken about um, things that they're doing in their office and what they want to see happen in the community to keep our children safe. So there's a lot of things that are happening here but there are also communities around the country that are not as fortunate. So as a result, we want to make sure that the information that we put out there, that it's being shared in a way that empowers parents to really support their children, that it empowers children to say, you know what, this, I know this man, I, I, I thought I really liked him, but I think something is not right to empower them to be able to say, I can go and speak to somebody in law enforcement and not be afraid to do that because that's going to be helpful. They're the ones that can protect you. They're the ones that can rescue you and put you in a safe place. They're the ones that can arrest the person that's hurting you. Um, and we want our children not to be afraid to let somebody know that something uncomfortable is going on in their life. And we work very closely with Douglas County PD and judges, so they're one of our great partners, so we work closely with them. So like you were saying, mm -hmm. yeah, contact your law enforcement. Okay, because if you contact law enforcement, then the chances are, hopefully, you can get the child out of this or get, get them identified Correct. and then maybe go after the trafficker you can. itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so then that the, the trafficker end of it goes into law enforcement, district attorney, grand jury, you know, goes mm -hmm. through that process. Mm -hmm. So there's the criminal indictments and all like that. You were saying earlier, Christy, that then the victim, the child, uh, at whatever age, y'all refer them over to Georgia to, Cares, to Georgia Cares mm -hmm. which is Sarah's group. What do y'all do with the child when one is referred to you? So they do an intake process, and that intake process will determine if that youth is a confirmed victim of CSEC or if they're at high risk. Um, we have licensed social workers that work with us that will work with those confirmed victims to put together a service plan and care plan. And they'll follow them through that care plan, ensuring that they're getting the best care and that they're getting um, done what needs to get done to make full recovery. Okay, mm -hmm. do you remove them from the situation? Can you get them out of the geographic area? So Georgia Cares, um, we don't have, a lot of people think Georgia Cares has safe, you know, safe yeah, beds safe at our haven. location. Yeah. We don't, but we work with a bunch of our partners to get those services. So we have safe home partners, we have medical providers. Okay, so you can actually back. physically yeah. and geographically remove them from the influence of the trafficker. We don't do the actual rescuing. No, but, yeah. the, but you have partners, we have partners who can that do. doing things mm -hmm. like that. Okay, and doing that. Now, Brenda, mm -hmm. your, organiza your organization, Youth Emporium, mm -hmm. and the initiatives that, that you do, mm -hmm. y'all done a phenomenal job in Thank our you. community at mm -hmm. educating. Mm -hmm. Talk about your, your, uh, your organization and we're, why you wanted to do this. Um, we're interested in education. Um, the, the trafficker is interested in young people, but often our young people are just naive. They don't understand what is happening to them when it is happening to them. They don't understand the strategies that traffickers employ. Um, and we want to make sure that the information gets out into the community, whether it's through a community forum that we sponsor or that we're contacted to go and do a forum for a church or a nonprofit organization. Um, and we do them not only in Georgia, but outside of the state as well. We want to educate young people because I believe that if they know what is getting ready to happen, they're less likely to continue with some of the behaviors that they have. We just recently did one for public health and the young people were lead in leadership roles in, in the schools that they attended. Um, but a lot of them were sitting there with their mouths open. You know, information that like they I were am. given. <laughs> they were like, oh my God, oh I didn't know, oh I didn't realize. Right. And we just want them to be aware. The more aware they are, the less likely of them becoming a statistic or a victim. You know, they can also share information with their friends, their followers, their Facebook friends, their Twitter followers, giving them information and education is only going to empower them. And, and that's a source of protection. And it's also a source of abduction avoidance. And that's where our primary goal is. 
One of the things that each of the three of y'all have brought up is that age of the victim mm -hmm. is honest, is basically almost irrelevant. That you were talking about, it could be babies. Yes. And you were talking about the naivety of preteens and mm -hmm. tweens. And then, and, and, and that struck me that, you know, we're talking about six year olds and seven year olds. Yes. And, things like this that can, who cannot make a decision that it's the parents who have to take care of that and so the education is it's so critical. important on, on, on that thing. Mm -hmm. um, how did you come across this mission? I went to Afghanistan many years ago um, working with a government subcontractor and even though youth empowerment existed at that time, um, and we were, you know, youth-based and youth-focused, and looking at different trends that associated that were associated with the youth culture, I wanted to expand our presence outside of the United States. And when I went to Afghanistan and I saw how girls and women were treated, um, you know, I was riding down um, one of the main roads in, in Afghanistan and happened to look to my right and there was a small compact car and inside of the uh, passenger seat were goats and men and the girls were in the trunk of the car um, with their mother and, and then people that I was riding with said, oh, oh, calm down, don't say anything. And I was like, oh my God, I can't believe that animals, you know, have or have, were held in higher esteem than the women and girls in this family. And they said, well, it's, it's more than just that. So I began, um, meeting with different uh, NGOs, um, organizations who were established here in the United States that had an arm of operation in Afghanistan and started developing um, a good rapport with them and began to really understand how children were being used as currency in that, you know, conflict zone. And they said, well, it's happening all over the place. And I started doing more research from a global perspective. And then when I got back home, I started looking at it more from a domestic perspective. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh my God, this is going on here and there. And, it, it, and I looked at it and I said, this is a global phenomenon that is repeating itself. Because um, when you think about the first slave ship landing in Jamestown in 1619, uh, coming from you, you know uh, the Netherlands, and here we have the same kind of situation where children are coming into the United States and our children are going into these foreign countries, this is history repeating itself. And I thought to myself, slavery was abolished, you know, in 1800s, why are we still talking about this situation? These individuals are still as evil as they were back then. Um, they've just gotten more sophisticated and they're looking at our children as a form of revenue. I have a six-year-old granddaughter and I said, I refuse not to do anything about it because I would hate to see that crime enter into my home. But as long as we have a computer, a tablet, a smart device, they're in our home. So we have to learn how to respond when we see things happening online, on our children's phones, tablets. We, we as parents and caregivers need to be able to support our children should something occur. But at the same time, we want to make sure that they're comfortable coming to us and saying, mommy, this person contacted me and this sounds kind of kooky, you know, whatever language they use, but feel comfortable enough to have that kind of conversation with their parent. Um, and that's what I, I want to do. That's what I want to make sure happens in our communities. Uh, one of the things I said earlier was that in 2014, the, the occurrence in Savannah is what kind of uh, reawakened my, my knowledge mm -hmm. of this. And now uh, Atlanta is uh, number 14 in the nation, something like that, mm -hmm. in child sex trafficking statistics according to the FBI. This is disturbing that we're having to do that and that even though our number of reported cases are not that huge, mm -hmm. we don't know that these things aren't happening, but on our doorstep just in the next county over, it obviously is. Mm -hmm. um, the education seems to be the, the, the very um, strongest link mm -hmm. in this, in, in breaking uh, the chain on, on that. 
bad analogy, but y'all understand what I'm talking about I do. on that. Tell me about Georgia Cares. How did that come about in handling, you know, working with this network? So when the state became aware of this issue of trafficking, Georgia Cares was created and we were an initiative of the Governor's Office for Family and Children. And we were with that and then in 2014 we became a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, and like you were saying about the warning signs and things like that, um, parents, if you go on our website, gacares.org, we have a screening tool that will walk you through. Um, it's a guide to help you make a referral to us. It shows you the warning signs and it'll walk you right through that process. Mm -hmm. So that, okay, here we go, here, here are the tools that you need, mm -hmm. and then here are the people who can help you. Correct. Mm -hmm. That all they've got to do, we have in our Sheriff's Department an investigative unit. We do. That, um, what all do y'all investigate, Christy? Well, I'm, I'm Pacific Investigator of Child Crimes. Um, I'm a forensic interviewer, I've been trained as a forensic interviewer, so um, I do nothing but child crimes, and um, sometimes um, we're broken in different departments. We have child crimes, domestics, um, robberies is what our unit, which is its crimes against persons. And then we have a unit that does um, property crimes, which are your thefts, your mm -hmm. all that, that kind of stuff, and your burglaries. And then we have a major case that does our major stuff, like our um, homicides and stuff like that. But you... Um, you know, we, we've got, it, in our community, you said it, we're blessed mm -hmm. to have law enforcement who cares enough to have a child protection unit, basically. Correct. You know, doing that. An organization that educates mm -hmm. and tries to get the word out and then a statewide organization will take care of these kids once we, once we do this. This is a horrible, horrible problem. Um, ladies, thank you. Thank you're you for welcome. being with me. Thank you for what you're doing, but thank you for the education you're giving me today and our viewers. Mm -hmm. um, as we roll the credits at the end of the show, you'll see how you can become involved with any of these agencies and how you can help and the links to websites and things like that so that you can be more aware and that you can be more educated. And thank you for being here. Thank you for watching. I hope that this discussion has brought a little bit more focus into this topic for you. I'm Wes Talon. See you next time.